Hi everyone, and thanks for joining me back on the Frugal Radio channel. In today's episode, we are going to look and listen to the kinds of signals that can be found in the VHF airband spectrum in and around airports. This includes the typical air traffic control channels found at regional and international airports, how your geographical location will determine what you hear, a quick way to work out if you can expect to hear both sides of the conversation, that is, air traffic controllers as well as pilots, the typical air traffic control positions manned at airports, and good sources for finding frequencies. If you want to find out what else is going to be covered in the entire series, please check out last week's episode by clicking the link above, which explains the other areas of aviation communications we will be looking into in the coming episodes. First, let's talk about receiving basics. VHF works on the line of sight principle, so your proximity to the airport makes a big difference to what you will receive. On the left here we have an airport. The antenna on top of the control tower is broadcasting the air traffic controller as he or she directs traffic. Our antenna is 50 miles away, and because of the curvature of the earth, this means signals from the control tower will not reach us. Aircraft flying in the vicinity of the airport are at a higher elevation, 2,000 feet in this example. Because they are higher up, their signal reaches our antenna. We will be able to hear transmissions that come from the pilots, even though we are unable to receive the transmissions that come from the control tower. Now, if we happen to live closer, say 25 miles from the airport, our antenna may well be able to receive signals from the control tower as well as from aircraft. This is simply because there is a line of sight path between the airport and our antenna. If you live in a reasonably flat area such as the prairies or if you're in an elevated position on a hill or mountain, your range will be increased even more. But if there are obstacles such as tall buildings or terrain between you and the airport, the signal may again be blocked from getting through. My radio room is located around 20 miles from Edmonton Airport. From this location, I can receive all the VHF voice transmissions from air traffic control at various strengths. However, I cannot receive some of the other VHF signals that are transmitted from the airport. For those, I would need to live a little closer. A lot of airports broadcast an ATIS signal. That stands for Automated Terminal Information Service and is a signal that's usually transmitted 24-7 from regional and international airports. This makes it very useful to see if you are in radio reception range of ground stations at the airport. If you can hear the ATIS broadcast, there is a good chance you will be able to receive the other ground transmissions such as tower, arrivals and departure controllers. If you are unable to receive the ATIS on the published frequency, you will most likely just receive aircraft transmissions when they are arriving or departing the airport. When you tune to an ATIS frequency, you will hear a digitized voice or recording providing information to pilots. It is important to note that ATIS is also available via VHF and SATCOM links, which we will talk about in future episodes. Your local airport might also have an AWOS, which is slightly different than ATIS, but serves a similar purpose. For now, let's have a quick listen to my local ATIS broadcast from Edmonton Airport. Edmonton International, Information Oscar, weather at 2200 Zulu, wind 120 at 12, Visibility 2 0, 21,000 scattered, 25,000 broken, temperature 7, dew point minus 1, altimeter 2 9 7 2, IFR approach, RNAV, Yankee or Zulu, runway 2 0 and runway 1 2. Pilots shall inform arrival on initial contact of requested approach. Arrivals and departures runway 20 or runway 12. Simultaneous arrivals may be in effect. Inform ATC that you have information, Oscar. The clearance delivery frequency is used to provide and confirm flight plans that have been filed by the airlines. While the aircraft is sitting at the gate, a pilot will call clearance. The controller will confirm a number of items beginning with the destination. Next, if the airport uses a specific departure procedure, a SID or standard instrument departure will be assigned. The SID is a predefined route that the aircraft must fly after takeoff. 
SIDs are used to safely direct the flow of traffic from airports to specific waypoints. There are multiple SIDs available at airports and their use is determined by factors like the departure runway, flight plan routing and so on. The SID chart here shows the Barton 1 Tango and 1 Victor departures from Liverpool John Lennon Airport in England, an airport I have flown from many times. Barton 1 Tango is for aircraft taking off on runway 27, while the Barton 1 Victor is for aircraft departing on runway 9. You'll notice that both departures deliver aircraft to Barton Waypoint at an altitude of 4,000 feet. I don't have time to go into the interpretation of the charts in this video, but I will say that if you live in the US, Canada, the UK or Australia, you can freely download charts such as these from various websites that I will show later in this episode. After the SID or departure instructions have been given, the clearance controller will either confirm the rest of the flight plan by saying cleared as filed, or will let the pilots know of any changes or amendments that have been made to the routing. An initial climb altitude will be provided, usually around four or 5,000 feet, and the cruise level will be confirmed along with an estimated time until the flight will be cleared to that altitude. Pilots will be assigned a departure frequency to call on once handed over from TAR, which can be programmed into their radios. The ATC assigned transponder code, known as a squawk, will also be provided. With this information, the pilots can get the flight computers programmed with the correct info and locate the relevant navigational charts. A point to note is that the clearance controller position is often staffed by the ground controller during quieter times or at smaller airports. Let's listen to an example of a clearance being given to an aircraft. And clear, clear, sure, 9010. Uh, we'll be in April 2 shortly, looking for a part 6 to Conklin. Mission 901, drum to start Conklin, Javon 1 departure. Flight plan route, final runway 1 2, squawk 4 2 1 7. HD clear, Mission 901, to Conklin Airport via Javon 1 departure. Flight plan route, final runway 1 2, squawk 4 2 1 7. As you could imagine, the ground controller is in charge of aircraft movements on the apron and taxiways. You will often hear aircraft call ground requesting permission to push back and start their engines. Once the aircraft is running and has performed its safety check, the controller will issue instructions directing it to the runways. This includes telling the pilot which taxiways to use in order to get to the departure runway. Once at or near the runway, the controller will ask the pilots to switch to the tar frequency. The ground controller also manages aircraft that have landed and just vacated the runway. These aircraft receive instructions in which taxiways to take to reach their gate. It's also quite common to hear ground vehicles such as bird units, runway inspectors and fire trucks talking to the ground controller and requesting permission to access aprons, taxiways and cross runways. Let's listen to some conversations on a ground control frequency. Afternoon, number uh, 17, 26, we're April 2 and ready to taxi 12. And for 17, 26, Edmonton ground runway 12, wind 120 at 12, altimeter 29 or 71, taxi Sierra Bravo, contact tower 1183, holding short. Joe, Sierra Bravo for uh, 12 and order tower holding short, number 17, 26. Next up, we have the tower controller. This person is in charge of the runways and the airspace in the immediate vicinity of the airport, usually up to a few thousand feet. It is the tower controller who issues takeoff clearances to departing aircraft and landing clearances to arriving aircraft. Low level VFR traffic, such as general aviation light aircraft and helicopters, can often be heard on this frequency when flying in the vicinity of a controlled airport. Larger airports may run multiple tower frequencies served by different controllers. In this scenario, controllers usually take responsibility for different runways. If the airport is not particularly busy, the tower controller may also be working ground control and clearance positions. Here is some communication on the Edmonton tower frequency. Edmonton tower, WestJet 4003, just uh, a little over five miles outside of uh, Devon Beacon on the ILS for 12. Touch at 4003, Edmonton tower today, runway 12, wind 19010, off route 29901, clear to land runway 12. Hey, check it out, clear to land 12, WestJet uh, 4003. Shortly after takeoff, flights are handed to a departure controller. This controller is usually situated in a radar room at the airport or possibly in an area control centre. 
they manage the flow of outbound traffic from the airport and ensure that the aircraft follow the standard instrument departure or receive appropriate vectors to get them towards their next waypoint on the flight plan. Once the aircraft reach a specified altitude or position, they will be handed off to a terminal area controller or control center. The departure controller is sometimes also working the arrivals and approach control frequency, meaning they're handling both inbound flights as well as the outbound. Interestingly, the departures position is not used much in the UK. Flights there are typically passed from TAR to radar or an approach frequency. Here is some audio recorded from my local departures frequency. Departure, good afternoon. Check 215 passing through 3600. Check 215, that is departure identified. Fire 14,000. 14,000 for Chinook 215. Temperature 1726, contact Edmonton Center 134.7. 134.7 now, Emperor 1726, good day. Most airports in North America use the term arrivals, but it's also commonly called approach in other parts of the world. At larger airports there may be multiple arrival or approach frequencies in use. In such areas you may also hear the term director being used as aircraft are handed from one part of the approach to another. The arrivals controller is usually situated in a radar room, not in the tower. He or she manages the flow of inbound aircraft, and at times may also be handling the departures simultaneously. Typically, when aircraft are 8 to 10 miles away from the airfield, they'll be handed over to the tower controller. In the UK, this position may well be called radar, and handling departures as well as arrivals. Let's listen to my local arrivals frequency for a moment. Arrival Canada 242, zip through 16,000 for 10,000 information Oscar. Air Canada 242, Edmonton, uh, arrival with Canada Looking for the RNAV RMP Yankee for runway 12. Air Canada 242, Rob, RNAV Yankee, runway 12. Applicant transition. Hey, clear the RNAV uh, Yankee runway 12, applicant transition, Air Canada 242. The terminal controller may be located in a radar room at the airport or at an ATC centre. They handle aircraft moving from airports to airways and from airways to airports. Terminal controllers will be directing other traffic within their specific control zones as well, so they are commonly quite busy frequencies. In high density areas such as London, England and New York, there are multiple terminal frequencies staffed by different controllers. In this recording, the Edmonton terminal controller is also staffing the arrival and departure positions. The transceivers at the airport are bandboxed, a term that means that all frequencies are linked together. This allows aircraft on multiple frequencies to all hear each other, as well as all hearing the controller. Hotel Whiskey Tango traffic, uh, just right at 12 o'clock, 4 miles, is the westbound dash 8, setting it up 10,000, I'll be stopping for Hotel Whiskey Tango in sight. Encore 3225, it's 7,000. 7,000, Encore 3225. Encore 3225, 3rd RNAV Yankee, runway 12, 2 lit transition. 3rd RNAV Yankee, 12, 2 lit, Encore 3225. Sergeant Kinger, Gulf Sierra, was confirmed with airborne off of 12, 2, climb to 3000 for 6000. Gulf Sierra, with the uniform Edmonton departure identified, climb 13000, turn left direct black position. Climb 13000 and left direct black position, was confirmed. Now that you know about the various positions relating to air traffic control at airports, you'll want to be able to find the frequencies at airports near you. The fastest way is probably to visit skyvector.com and click the airports link at the top of the page. You can either look up airports by region or type in the ICIO code. Upon doing so, you will be taken to a page which has a section entitled Airport Communications. This provides a list of the currently active frequencies. This is a worldwide database. You've seen the Edmonton page. Let's look at the frequencies in use at Liverpool, England. And these are the frequencies in use at LaGuardia in New York. Perhaps you'll notice they use two clearance frequencies, three ground control frequencies and three departure frequencies among the other frequencies listed on the page. Flightplan.com is another useful resource if you're in North America. Here you can access digital charts like the SID and STAR charts in use at airports around the world. 
type in the airport ID in this example it's Las Vegas McLaren International and scroll down to the chart section that you wish to view once you find the chart like the standard instrument departure chart here it will open up in your browser you can rotate it zoom in and there you will see the actual uh, air traffic control routings in addition to the frequencies on the left hand side of the screen Aviation authorities in different regions produce these charts and make them available online. Links to the UK NAT site, NAV Canada and Air Service Australia are provided in the description below and on my companion site at frugalradio.com. Hopefully there's been some good information for you in this video. In the next episode we will look and listen to other types of VHF communications that are frequently used. If this video has been helpful, please take the time to leave a comment and let me know, or even just hit the like button. Thanks to all my current subscribers, it's great having you back on the channel. If you're not yet a subscriber and you've enjoyed a few videos from the channel, I would love to have you join by clicking the subscribe button right away. It actually helps other people find the channel when you subscribe. Well, that's all for now. I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode. This is Frugal Radio, over and out.